and open it up for dialogue and Q&A. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to invite uh, Engineer Farouk uh, to make his opening remarks. Thank you, Patrick. And good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as someone from the public sector, I'd like to start my discussion focusing on some key issues. First, I'd like to go through some of the best practices in energy efficiency around the world. Then, I'd like to mention uh, energy efficiency policy direction and targets in Nigeria. And then finally, I would like to end up by talking a bit about what is happening in Nigeria right now with regards to activities in energy efficiency. But before all this, uh, building on what Alex has said, uh, I would like to give some background to the context of energy efficiency so that the discussion could be well suited. It is important to recognize that in recent times, energy efficiency has been receiving serious recognition. And this is coming mostly from the public sector and business executives. Uh, for us in the public sector, the policy makers, we see energy efficiency as a means of providing sustainable energy to citizens, also as a means of attaining to our climate commitments. At the same time, it's, it's something that we see as a goal, I mean, as a means of attaining economic development and job creation. Uh, for business executives, generally, they look at energy efficiency. Uh, there are proven cases as a means of cost savings, profitability, business, and competitiveness. So this underscores the essence why energy efficiency is taken very serious. Uh, because it's to do with economic uh, development, social development, and uh, environmental benefits. Uh, just a few years back, the United Nations and the World Bank uh, keep on talking a lot about these issues. And they have adopted energy efficiency as one of those tools to address uh, universal access to modern energy. Now, in doing that, a number of initiatives have been instituted across the world. In particular, the Sustainable Energy for World Action Agenda can be singled out as having its roots into having to double global energy efficiency by their 2030 as compared to the baseline of 2010. Now, this is a huge agenda that has been adopted by the United Nations General Assembly. Again, to underscore the importance of the subject of today, uh, African Union and the New Partnership for Africa's Development, NEPAD, as well as the UNDP, uh, UN, United Nations Programme for uh, Development, together with African Development Bank, came together also to set up the Civil Africa Hall in Abidjan, Cote d'Ivoire, with the whole focus of helping the continent, African continent, to address issues of energy efficiency as well as renewable energy. At regional, or rather at some regional level, the Virginia Air Force heads of state uh, gathered in Abuja in 2004 to adopt a far-reaching policy, regional policy on energy efficiency. Now all these are clear pointers to the fact that energy efficiency is a global issue, is a regional issue, is a continental issue, and it is a local issue because the activities ought to be local, ought to be done by the industries, by the housing sector, by the transport sector. Now, what are we doing in Nigeria? In 2015, arising from all of this and our commitment to the Paris Agreement and the rest, the federal government also initiated discussion and we were able to have the first ever dedicated policy that articulates the target strategies and measures to attaining our energy efficiency targets. And the focus has been 
in energy efficiency in the electricity sector, in the housing sector, in the industrial sector, and in clean cooking. Uh, arising from that policy, a national energy efficiency action plan was prepared and was approved in Kaduna on July 2016. Most of you may have been there. And that document articulates the roles of and responsibility of different elements of the, of the sector, both public and private, and place the body on the Honorable Minister of Power to articulate the way forward in terms of delivering this, looking at energy efficiency as something to do more with the electricity industry. Now, we don't have so much time, but I want to talk a bit about the global best practices in energy efficiency. This has to do with clarity of targets, it has to do with standards and levels, energy efficiency standards and levels that ensure enforcement and, and, and follow-ups. It also has to do, I mean these standards include a number of, of things, including minimum energy performance standards, energy management standards, and so on and so forth. Again, globally where these things have been successful, you find capacity building and awareness creation as, as key factors uh, to, to drive this. Uh, this is away from uh, economic and regulatory policies of government that is coming uh, in terms of duty waivers, in terms of tax reliefs, and so on and so forth. So, including even sharing energy efficient lighting options uh, to ensure this happens. Now, what is the Nigerian energy efficiency policy cross? Three things were articulated. The first is energy efficiency should be recognized as a I mean as a tradable resource that could be the first power plant, I mean a, the first batch of power plant before a power plant. So which means that before you build a power plant, for instance, you first of all identify what are the energy efficient measures that you can take to save your power. The policy articulates that uh, and embraces that and allows the regulator to go ahead and come out with a parishing regulatory instrument that would allow this to happen. Again, energy efficiency has been recognized as a valuable tool for public-private partnership. For instance, if you have street lights that have incandescent lights and a private entrepreneur would like to invest money, save money, you may save energy, in terms he can share in the cost of the savings. So all this has been well articulated within the policy cross of the of the of the uh, area of 2015. Now, in terms of targets that are set by this policy, overall, the policy provides for energy efficiency of 20% by 2020 and 50% by 2030, compared to baseline of 2010. Uh, in terms of lighting, it is estimated that, or it is projected that energy efficiency should reach 40% in terms of lighting, use of efficient lighting by 2020 and 100% uh, by 2030. Again, for energy intensive industries like, uh, I mean, like transport, uh, industrial sector in general, is expected to attain an improvement in energy efficiency by of 20%. By, by their 20, uh, 2020 and 50% by their 2030. All this has been articulated on year by year basis and detailed actions and measures, strategies that will be done and identification of different entities has been done. I think before we leave, we can share with you some of the documents that articulate all of this. Uh, I know I'm running short of time, but uh, of course, the, the, the target includes distribution, uh, I, mean, I mean, distribution losses, reduction, conversion from cars to, to buses to rails, 
which of course is already happening. We, we already have real slides going around in the country, and all these are articulated in these policies that, that are already approved by, by the Federal Security Council. Now, to point out the key achievements so far in terms of moving forward with energy efficiency in Nigeria, uh, I would say the Federal Security Council have approved the policy in 2015, I've mentioned that. Uh, NACO, National Council of Power, approved the National Energy Efficiency Action Plans. Uh, again, the Honorable Minister of Power was the housing, uh, Mr. Bakotundi Raji Fashola has also approved energy efficiency building guidelines, which, which was launched uh, last year to, to guide the industry on to do more to about uh, energy efficiency in building. Uh, energy efficiency building codes are already at the final stage of, of being a full policy of NESP, the, the program that uh, Mrs. Ina is, is managing. Uh, quite a lot of others done by SON. SON is National uh, Standard Organization of Nigeria. SON, under the pyramids of industry, trade, and investment, has been able in the recent uh, times to approve a number of ordinary standards, particularly, like I mentioned, uh, the approval of a standard for lighting, which is set of what kind of lighting you should have, a standard for refrigeration, standard for air conditioning. All this has been approved. Uh, ISO 2001 energy management standards, as well as uh, minimum energy performance standards. All these standards are major milestones that have been achieved and they are applied even in Western countries. So it's not for the private sector, for the individuals to take charge of these issues and the enforcement agencies, of course, to make sure things are actually uh, happening. Uh, again, a number of other things have happened. Uh, development partners have provided a lot of work, particularly in terms of providing technical assistance to industry, I can mention two here, I'm sure uh, I, I wouldn't want to, to, to take the credit of, of what NDSP has done since uh, uh, my friend Lawrence is here. He would be able to talk a lot more about those support that are going directly to industries and that are that we making savings in terms of, of energy efficiency. Uh, finally, uh, I would like to mention that energy efficiency uh, it's not just uh, an issue for discussion, it's an issue for making make money, for savings. And a recent report, uh, again, courtesy of the, the NESP, which is the program I coordinate from the Ministry of Power Science, so I, I, I'm also entitled to explain uh, those terms. Uh, I mean, it shows, a recent study shows that if we adopt uh, energy a minimum energy performance standard for air conditioning within a moderate range that is using UER 3.6, we will be in a position to save as much as 22,000 gigawatt hour electricity by the year 2025, and 45,000 by the year 2030. Uh, just from the ACs, so you can imagine the lighting, the refrigeration, and so many other things that, that could potentially be, be used. And of course, this also comes with the added advantage of savings in terms of uh, emissions, uh, climate emissions, and so on and so forth. So, to, to just wrap up, uh, energy efficiency is a global issue, and it's an economic issue, so it's something that should be given good attention and the current uh, uh, I mean ministry leadership of the Ministry of Power together with leadership of other member ministries recognize this. Our development partners are helping us a lot in terms of achieving these objectives and we hope that there will be a lot of virtual power plants through the energy efficiency savings that we are going to have in coming uh, years. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, it's very good to speak at times in a because he makes the world a lot easier with his insights. I mean, we all know how much in Farouk knows as far as the National Renewable Energy and Energy Policy is concerned. So, 
that makes my work a lot easier. It means I don't have to go through the whole program information. I will just go straight to looking at um, best practice recommendations as far as energy efficiency policies are concerned, where we are in Nigeria, and then you know what more we could possibly do. Um, my name is Lawrence Edeke, and I work with the NSP, the Nigeria Energy Support Program. Um, the advice of on energy efficiency in the industrial sector. Um, now, it's fair to say that there are quite a number of standard recommendations for energy efficiency policies. These are recommendations from IEA, the International Energy Association, um, that needs to be incorporated into policies to make them robust. For, for us in Nigeria, we already have the National Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Policy, and it's, I think it's fair to say that the policy does contain a few of those key elements, which I will run through uh, very quickly. And then we can look at what else we could do to strengthen the policy. Uh, what are the few issues that we, we, we highlighted? Uh, one of the very key recommendations for robust energy efficiency policy is the need for structured, coordinated um, energy end use data. Because you need data so that you can actually have um, you know, ta targets that are data driven, that are specific. Um, you also need another recommendation that talks about energy management protocols. And what stands out in this set of recommendations is the energy management system protocol specifically the ISO 50001, which is a global standard for, for energy management system. Maybe at this point, I should just quickly say that it's, it's a good thing that we have actually adopted this standard in Nigeria, and we've done a couple of work um, in that regard, which I'll be happy to share with us as we go on. Um, there is also a recommendation on minimum energy performance standards, um, which Farouk already talked about as being contained in the in the ENRI, the National Renewable Energy Policy. Um, what is also very critical in this set of recommendations is complementary financial policies that grants incentives and will therefore drive energy efficiency investments. And last but not the least, because we are focusing on the industrial sector, is a suite of policies that are specifically tailored for SMEs. Because the SMEs have their own peculiarities, and therefore uh, we have to talk about that as well. Um, now, where are we in terms of the policies that we, the policy that we have in place, and the things that we have? Uh, one of the key things I like to highlight here is that yes, we do have a policy that contains a number of these elements that I have highlighted, but we do see a major challenge in implementation moving the policy from paper to actually actual programs that are implementable. And there is scope for a lot of things to be done in this regard. And, and I think that it is, it is incredible that, or it is commendable that we do actually have the EU funded NESP because uh, what that program has done is to try and move a few of these um, programs, a few of these recommendations to actual programs, as, as I will talk about as we go along. Um, now, in doing so, specifically for the industrial sector, it is fair to say that the ENRI assistance does not have specific targets and strategies that is targeted at the industrial sector to actually improve energy efficiency. With the view that, you know, this can actually make the sector more competitive. Now, I don't think there's a better time to talk about energy efficiency in the industrial sector than now, considering that you know we are in the era where we are promoting locally manufactured goods, we want to promote um, manufacturing in Nigeria, and therefore we need to also discuss how we make the manufacturing sector more competitive, especially when you look at the energy components of production costs in the Nigerian industry. A study from 2014 by the National Bureau of Statistics puts the energy cost of production in Nigeria at 41% of intermediate inputs. Now this is less than 20% in other clients like Turkey or China or India. So this is also something to look at. I did talk a little earlier on, on data and the need to actually 
drive that because if you have data, it means you can actually have targets that are informed. I mean, one clear evidence of the need for this is if, if for those of us who also have had um, access to the National Energy Efficiency Action Plan, you will see that uh, on the section for the industrial sector, there are actually a number of blank spaces because we do not have data. And when we don't have data, it means it's very difficult to actually have targets. So, where do we go from here? We know what the recommendations are. We do have a policy. We've seen a few things that we haven't done. Um, where we go from here is we need to have programs that are specific. Specific in the sense that industries by their nature are concentrated in certain hubs. So what you need to do is you need to have programs that are specific to those hubs. There are a few examples from, policy, from you know, successful policies in India or China where you have, for example, a free energy audit scheme in a specific industrial hall. So for example, we could go to Sandu Water or Kanu or Kakuri in Kaduna. These are specific industrial halls. And we could have a project there, a program there, which is a follow-up of the policy. There are also other ones, like the Energy Efficiency Network, which is a concept from Germany that is tried out in other parts of the world, very successful. And interestingly, one of the programs that we have piloted um, in Lagos with, with five companies at the moment, again, for sake of time, I'll reserve the details when I come to the table. Um, the last one over this is the need for us to also look at how we can actually bring in incentives. Incentives that can actually drive investment in energy efficiency. And the example I want to close with is the energy motors example from the policy instrument in South Africa, where you actually have ESCOM, which is the utility company there, driving the replacement of inefficient motors in the industrial sector at subsidized rate to help drive both adoption of energy efficiency and investment in energy efficiency. Thank you very much for your time. I look forward to your questions. Uh, uh, um, 25 minutes to share with us what they've done in Coca-Cola uh, with energy efficiency. Good evening. How do you make me look like a master? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, greetings from Nigeria Housing Company, the makers of Coca-Cola, and greetings from Lagos. I would like to say this as, um, as I start. Um, in God we trust, but in every other thing, data. And as I sat there, I looked at my senior colleagues, churn out data. Data that we cannot refuse. We can't challenge those data because a lot of work has been put into it. In Nigerian government company, that is one of the things we try to do. We have invested a lot in understanding how does energy impact our business. And when we embarked on this journey about eight or eight years ago, one of the reasons we did that was because we discovered 40% of our production cost was going to energy. And that's what um, Lawrence and Engineer Farouk just confirmed. And because of that, there was a need to in, in, involve the business in what we call energy efficiency. We also embarked on the energy efficiency journey because it was also a, a global, um, okay, so it was also something our CEO needed to focus on and give us leadership as a business. NBC is part of 28 companies, and we call ourselves the Coca-Cola Learning Coding Company. Nigeria and 20, 27 other countries in Europe, and that's what makes the group. And so we have set a target for ourselves, which is to reduce our energy use. We call that KBI energy use ratio. The target is to reduce it by 40% by 2020, based on our 2010 baseline. And that's what drives the whole business. And so I'll start from there. Energy efficiency in NBC came from leadership. They provided direction. They provided support. And to be very honest, they provided the funding. And as I said earlier, in everything we do, every production plant, every shift, every country, energy efficiency is a major KPI for the shop floor guys, for the plant manager, 
for the, the, the general manager for the country and for the group CEO himself. NIG Efficiency is a major KBI in our operation. But what have we done, what have we really done that has helped us to reduce our operating costs in terms of energy? We have tried to look at how can we maximize the streams of energy. So we've looked at investments in CAPEX and investments in OPEX. Investment in CAPEX comes in the installation of CHP plants, that's a combined heat and power plant. We have these installations in locations where we have ready-made gas supply through the pipe network. And with that, the gas supply into a gas generator can give us three streams of energy, electricity, steam, and cold water, which we use for our operation. Now, what that has done is, instead of having independent streams, we have just one equipment giving us the three streams. And so that's alone reduced energy by over 60%, the cost of generating energy in any of those facilities. What else, what else would we also do? Plants that are very close to this, to where we have the pipe network, we've also connected through compressed natural gas systems. So we bring in gas in trucks and provide gas to those um, facilities and we're able to install efficient um, CHD plants. Now, we look at plants where we don't have gas, especially up north, and what we've done is to partner with distribution companies to run our plants mostly on the national grid. And we all know in terms of the efficient ways, because like I said, our commitment to energy efficiency is not just cost-based, it's also climate. And so when we run our plants on the grid, now running it on the grid has also cost us some money because we've had to invest in um, UPS, uninterruptible power supply systems, so that when there is any fluctuation or instability, our operation does not feel the impact of that. And so we've dealt, we want to do this in terms of investing in capital expenses. When I mean capital, I mean real capital expenses. And what else that we also do, we also look at the operational expenses side. So we invest in capex and we also invest in opex. And what this means is every plant sits down and look what are the simple things we can do to reduce the energy that we use in producing a bottle of coke. And we look at things like lighting, we, we implement lighting efficiency and lighting control. We also implement one of the biggest pillars of our energy efficiency implementation is employee awareness. Now employee awareness is actually to twofold. We try to make sure the employee understands why we as a company are implementing energy efficiency. And we also try to show them what we call W2FM, what's in it for me, what's in it for each of these employees. What's in it for them is we let them know what they can do at home that can also help them um, save costs on energy. Because to all of us, everyone living on the face of the earth, energy is a cost that drills a big hole in our pocket. So as they help the business to achieve energy efficiency, we also let them see, you can also do, implement some of this at home and you will save some money on energy efficiency. Um, well, in trying to round up, because I'm sure my time is up, we have benefited a lot from energy efficiency as a company. Um, one of the things we benefited is through the Nigerian Life Support Program, through the Energy Efficiency Network. The Nigerian Working Company has had to be a partner with them. We've benefited from sharing knowledge with other companies and we've also seen where we can improve and how we can help other companies. Because by sharing knowledge, those companies see what we've done and what they can also do. Um, in terms of our bottom line, and I, there was a particular year, the major part of our profitability, I'm talking about within the last five years, the major part of our profits in Nigeria Building Company came from energy efficiency projects for that year. Because it was a very steep, as we faced a lot of economic challenge that year, but almost 50% of the profit was attributed to energy efficiency. And in terms of, in terms of the climate, where every day, every year, we're moving closer to our climate goal, which we must achieve by the year 2020. And so we get that benefit by implementing energy efficiency. And what Florence said last is what I want to say last. We need you to motivate us, engineer Farouk.
at least give us some incentives. Maybe we'll even invest more. We will also yeah, implement more things on energy efficiency. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think maybe a good place to start is from where he, he ended, Idina um, Farouk. I read the policy, the clear targets for 2020, 2030. There's also clarity on what needs to happen and where those targets are expected to be achieved uh, through. But what is missing is I haven't seen the specific program that government hopes to use to drive this policy. So I was wondering if you could spend uh, a few minutes just to talk about these targets, the 20%, the 50%, the 20%, the 100% for lighting. How does government intend to get the private sector to work with it to achieve these targets? Well, thank you again, Patrick, uh, for that question. Uh, we are at a very early stage, uh, obviously. Uh, having said that, I think quite a number of things are currently happening. Uh, I've said the first thing is to stage, to set the stage for this thing to happen. Uh, there is going to be a massive housing program that the federal government is embarking on. And one of the things that is anticipated in those program is to ensure that all those houses are energy efficient houses. Now, as I've said earlier, energy efficiency is an economic issue. And so, it is something that when people get to know about it, they will naturally embrace it. And as we speak, a number of workshops, a number of awareness campaigns are happening with agencies like, I mean, partners like GIZ, I mean, uh, NESP. So, I, I won't point at any very robust program that is currently running. But what I would say is, having set the stage, having start coming up with these uh, guidelines, with these standards, before last week, before last month, there were really no approved standards or, or, or uh, levels. So essentially, you need to start crawling before you start working and then before you start uh, going. So we're at the early stage, but, but definitely the vision, the focus, and the understanding of the issues is there within the policy space. I'm going to come back and push a bit harder on this issue because yes. I think the challenge we have is we read the policy documents and that agreement but it don't quite translate to the results because there's no clarity on the programs or how we, you know, we intend to implement them. So before I, I get back to you on that, I'd like to talk to Lawrence a little bit to see what is the NESP uh, advising government on as to how to translate these policies into progress. Thank you, Patrick. Um, one of the key things the NESP is advising government on is actually implementing projects. Projects that literally transfers the, the, the very good ideas in the policy into actually programs, which we can then scale up, we can then repeat, we can then obviously share the, the success stories. And I give a few examples. We are, the NSP, for example, is working very closely with SOM, with Manufacturers Association of Nigeria, with NASIMA, the Nigerian Association for Chambers of Commerce, Industry, Mines, and Agriculture, to implement, to introduce, first introduce energy management systems in the industrial sector based on global best practice, which is a standard, and then obviously implement this in two different companies too, so that you can then get you know, data which can then become a benchmark for promoting the adoption of energy efficiency in the industrial sector. That's on one hand. On the other hand, the NESP is also supporting the energy efficiency network concept because what research has also shown is that there is a great deal of learning amongst peers. So if you have a heterogeneous network, by heterogeneous I mean a network that has companies from different sectoral groups or with cross-cutting technology. I mean, IODG here uses, uh, uses STEAM 
even though he's, he's Coca-Cola. Somebody who is manufacturing steel also uses steam. So either way, they all have a boiler. So you bring people who have cross-cutting technologies into a room, you moderate the session, you have expertise being given to everyone, they get to exchange knowledge and learn a lot. We are doing this as well. We have the first pilot of the energy efficiency network um, in Lagos with five companies actively participating. And you know, there's a great deal of result that is going to come from this. So these are some of the things we're doing. Sure, but when I read the policy, right, they talked about some minimum uh, standards, right? So for height, for instance, um, layman thinking about these issues, if we were to have only energy efficiency light bulbs in Nigeria, we we'll, would, by a matter of course, have to be using energy efficiency light bulbs. So are there these specific ideas being considered today? Um, we talked about uh, boilers, you know, changing the boilers in the industry. You know, there are more efficient boilers in the market. What are we doing to ensure that only energy efficient, efficient boilers you know, make it into the market? How are we working with various partners to ensure this? Are some of these things coming through in your discussions with government? Sure. Um, I should have mentioned that actually, but thank you for, for, for reminding me. One of the other very uh, key projects that the NESB has supported is the introduction of minimum energy performance standards for household appliances with a specific focus on air conditioners. Now, of course, there are so many appliances that need to have minimum energy performance standards. We see this in other plants. But we've started with air conditioners, working very closely again with this one. And I think we have some of the leaflets on the room uh, because that's a very uh, pro new project we've just sort of run it up on. And what that simply does is it specifies the minimum energy that air conditioners should actually consume. You know, and that way we sort of fizzle out all the inefficient um, and air conditioners. And what, and, and what that does is it sets in motion the, you know, the process of replicating this initiative for all other appliances. There are refrigerators, there are televisions, there are microwaves, there are electric ions. This, this, the list is endless. So of course we're also doing something in America. And how is government responding to these ideas? And in answering that question, bearing in mind that we have this is not the first time we're hearing these types of things. So what are we doing differently this time to ensure that we actually uh, Patrick, you read the policy and you will see that the energy efficiency policy structured the energy efficiency programs into sectoral levels. And you have energy efficiency building, energy efficiency industry like that. Now, just like Lauren said, if you take for instance energy efficiency industry, you find SOM has the responsibility of coming out with those standards that the industry will look at and adopt. And it has the responsibility of enforcement of those standards in terms of coming up with this, uh, the minimum energy performance standard. And that is exactly what is happening right now. But the, the movement into energy efficiency is a, is, is a process, it's not an event. So we are starting first with voluntary deployment of these this standards. Because you don't just wake up overnight and say every company uh, should be like Coca Cola today. So I, I think the process is, is evolving and, and what is important is that the standards are there and there is awareness because at the end of the day these are economic issues. These are issues that when you understand them, you adopt them. Uh, many of us here have already replaced our incandescent lights. We hope. Well, we, 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 yeah. Many, many of us, I believe, do. Now, one of, the, one of the issues that one of the programs the government is doing to ensure that is, is trying to ensure that it's cost reflective tariffs. Because as long as you are paying, it's like if you are, you are pulling the money from your pocket. So, uh, quite a lot of things happening across board. Uh, in terms of clean cooking, the, the Minister of the Environment has, has been at the forefront in making sure that there is replacement of this cooking. I remember about year two or two, there was a major program that, that runs into billions of naira in terms of providing clean cooking uh, stops just to, 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 to be efficient in terms of cooking. So quite a number of things are happening, but, but these things uh, will not be uh, maybe things that must be ordered today. 
Uh, and this is the point I wanted to emphasize. Sure. Um, let's talk a bit more about Coca-Cola. Um, many in the room will say, well, Coca-Cola is a big company, or Nigeria is a big company. You know, it's a big uh, company, and they can decide to go down this route and make this huge capital expenditure, etc. Um, but from your experience going through and people are managing that process, what are some of the ideas that can be uh, implemented in other industries in Nigeria that are probably not at the same scale um, that you're at? Uh, little changes that can still lead to these cost savings uh, that can be generated from energy efficiency. Thank you, Patrick. I think the first thing I would recommend is the leadership. Because even in the likes of the 2001 document, you, you cannot implement that without the top management of the company. So I believe any leader in any of those companies, whatever size, it only that employs 20 people. Uh, the tower, 500, 200. The leader must be committed to energy efficiency. And that probably needs to understand energy efficiency yes, and the so yeah. knowledge of energy efficiency. Okay. And of course, training for the employees. Okay. Because when you train them, they will appreciate the reason for implementing that. So when we tackle the area of knowledge, everybody's on the same platform and they know the reason why we're implementing this. And the next thing is obviously they should set the standard. What do we want to achieve as a company? If we understand what energy efficiency is, okay, what do we want to do? What actions do we want to take? Now these actions will lead to procurement action, as they've said about air conditioners. For example, I'm an individual. When I go out now, I don't buy anything without checking the label. <coughs> I told my wife recently we saw a, a farm. It was 30 watts. A, a, a rotating fan. And I told her, okay, with this then, I can, you can put it on throughout the night. The solar will, the batteries will take that. But currently, the batteries, the fan we have, the batteries will take that. So that means understanding energy efficiency and taking the step of actually who we want to buy, how we want to buy it. Let me reference Lawrence and the consultant that is working with us. They both visited the factory recently. And the factory did not know that the equipment they procured was on the high side in terms of energy efficiency. They never knew. So long as they went there with the consultant and they bought the equipment, they were installing it, I think. So when we go to the point of procurement, because in MDC for us, we already have that in our procurement policy. Any lights we're buying now has to be an LED. And we are buying lights now because we're doing a lot of upgrades in our facilities around the country. So I would recommend that to any other small business. Lawrence, what would you say to any other you know, business people in the room who run you know, SME scale industries? Uh, what are some of the things, things they can start doing by tomorrow morning? Sure, uh, that's, that's actually a very good point. I think the way I want to address this is first and foremost by talking about ISO 15001, which is a framework for energy efficiency, because that's the standard, the best standard. And there is a very, very interesting line in that document. It says that the, the standard is applicable to organizations of all sizes, irrespective of their business area and their location. So what that means is, if you follow through this very simple process, when you have the management buying, there is enough awareness, they have a policy, they now look at what is specific to them. Now, one thing that is very critical with energy efficiency is the people factor. Because the people are just as good as the most efficient energy, most efficient technology that you put in place. So there's a lot of a lot of uh, attitudinal changes that need to come on board because in energy efficiency there are things we call low-hanging fruits. I have a consultant friend who likes to call them fruits lying on the ground. Because they are very basic things like lighting. In, at, in the industrial setting, there are very basic things like idling machinery, conveyor belts running when nobody is producing, and these things literally they just drain the whole energy. And this is of course. So the people side of things is my answer to that question. People need to be aware of the factory, and then they can start looking at the specifics within their factories. How? I'm thinking how can how can we do this for people? Like so. 
you're a businessman, you're worrying about you know, where you're going to make the next sales from, how to pay salaries, you know, etc. Um, but you also know that there's this energy efficiency thing that they're talking about. How do you make it concrete for them? Um, is it in running some calculations to show people how much? You know, are you guys at uh, NESB thinking about some of these types of information? Yeah, certainly. Um, for the industries, the biggest motivation for energy efficiency is actually cost savings as against energy savings. So the cost factor is what drives the entrepreneur to actually make savings. And you, if you remember when I was making my remark, I did give that example of you know free audits in specific locations as one of the interventions that government could bring on board. So you need, if, you, if what you don't measure, you can't manage. It's as basic as that. You need an audit to actually establish what the energy flow is in a certain company, where does it come from, where does it go to, what is actually using all the energy that comes in, and then on the basis of that, you can then make a case. Now, further to that, this is the more reason why the NESP has pilot projects, because you need to bring home these case studies. There are numerous case studies out there. I mean, the internet is awash with case studies, but you need to bring them home. case studies? Foreign case studies, but now we're bringing Nigerian case studies. We have the first two companies that have um, implemented the, the energy management system. First two to be certified in Nigeria. Then we have the, the energy efficiency network with five companies. There will be a brochure on that detailing what each company has seen in-house, specific to the company, and what they identify that as measures to help them improve their energy performance. So we're bringing all this to bear so that companies can learn from it. Excellent. Yeah. Um, we'll open up for uh, questions in a minute. Um, but one of the reasons why we do this is also policy advocacy, right? And we know that you, Farouk, and your colleagues at the ministry, you've done this great work on policy, um, but maybe some of the other parts of the government of partners are not buying into it as much as you would like to see at this moment. Are there things you would want to see on that policy side uh, that is not happening currently that we can use this platform to give voice to? Yeah, I think, uh, thank you Patrick for that. Uh, I think I don't want to put it as if the agencies are not cooperating. I, I want to put it as if the stage the, the chair sector is, uh, is such that you don't expect energy efficiency to be addressed in that massive way because of the lack of awareness, also because of the current situation in the, the, the industry itself. Uh, a lot of people are complaining that you don't have power, the why are you energy. So many things are, are being discussed. But having said that, I think it's very important if at this stage the enforcement uh, in terms of uh, this level of awareness creation of the levels that are here and the savings that partners should be able to talk more about these issues and of course this kind of platforms should be able to create uh, forums where discussions on energy efficiency will be held. Uh, I think these this are some of the areas that I think could potentially at this stage uh, create uh, a volume addition for people to address it as, as their own uh, kind of ideas. Excellent. Okay, um, let's take a few questions or comments. Um, um, basically, from everything I've uh, heard and understand, uh, I can say that I know that the knowledge of um, the cost of energy drives people to maybe make more energy efficient uh, decisions in whatever they are doing. And more of the um, things that have been said relates to industry. And I know that uh, in 10 years' time, we will have a business today, we'll in business in 10 years' time. And there's a policy that he talks about uh, that has been drafted and probably will be made running very soon. Now, in that policy, sir, is there any provision for educating people that are not presently in uh, business, for example, the ordinary person who is who is on the streets, who goes to the uh, shop to buy a bulb, for example, and he just wants to fix light in his house. Sure. Sure. So is there any permission for something like that? Essentially, what is government doing? Uh, my name is Gabriel. Yes, I say I'm from Sierra Consulting. I'd like to start this way, and from Farouk particularly. Which agency of government 
is responsible for driving this policy. And it's that agency here to answer a few questions as to what they're doing, where they are, and the challenges faced so far. I like what Lawrence said about low hanging fruit. I was in a program in Ghana when uh, the issue of uh, energy efficiency was being discussed. And I understand that the government took a very aggressive policy, you know, to reap these uh, low hanging fruits. They started with the energy saving box. They set a target when all incandescent bulbs will be wiped out. Correct. Now, when that target reached, government went out to enforce it. And I can't quote the figure of the power that was even the energy that was saved just by that simple action or activity. And so I think that uh, there is a need for us to have clarity. First, on the agency that is driving this. And Second, target dates. Uh, yeah, target dates and what they are doing. And if there are, you know, and other agencies of government that are connected with this, how are they collaborating? How are they working together? Excellent. My name is Farouk from GC Green Environment and Energy Conservation Initiative. Back in 2013-14, we had a <clears throat> back in 2013-14, we had some research in Lagos, in particular SMEs, because SMEs are the key drivers of every economy. 90% of industries in Nigeria are basically SMEs. So I can say I'm a certified energy manager in ISO 15001. So I've been promoting energy efficiency since back in 2014. Uh, one, one question, I have two questions for Mr. Farouk. Uh, what came all around was like, when we went to the industries, they basically don't know what's energy efficiency. They want to, what benefits that can be driven from it. That means they lack awareness and the financial incentive that can be driven from it. So what's the Ministry of Power Power doing on that, and what what measures are you taking now to establish for to create a platform for East Coast energy serving energy serving companies to help in to help in energy audit and so on and so forth for us to have a better a better and efficient energy saving measures. Excellent. Good evening, everyone. My name is Mike Obasi. Also, my question is directed to you know, Mr. Faru. Um, you said um, energy efficiency is taken serious because it has economic and environmental benefits. And um, you also mentioned about cost reflective tariff. Now, and um, it reminds me, though we had discussed previously about that, but it's a good opportunity for me now to ask you when are we going to be able to achieve cost reflective tariff? Thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh, Patrick, thank you for this uh, platform. And I also appreciate the role that my platform foundation is playing. It's the same question. And I came from the sports gentleman that went to Ghana. What you say? The, our, uh, my thinking is that you probably need to have an MSA in this program. NEMSA is the Nigerian Electricity Management Service Agency because they work with the registered electrical partition. The man that wires your house, the man that buys your ball, the man that buys your electrical products. I don't know if that part of this program and the other dimension of power. Then, we have been talking about good policy, action plan, everything. But then you know there's a problem in the country. Uh, barrister fashion passionate about what he's doing. And then he moves to, I don't want to say sack, the cost minister of class. The next minister, because we need to have this level of ownership at the highest level of government. The budget for 2018 is coming in. Government is going to give ministries and agencies money to spend. Where is the policy in this budget? They're going to use the same money and can buy what they like. Or are we saying by 2018, government will have a red line. If you give me money for electricity, energy, whatever, it's going to be energy efficient. So essentially, government should be pretty. They should be anyway. We need to see that. That's commitment. Excellent. Good evening. 
My name is Walter. I'm a visitor of your great country. Uh, I come from Europe, and uh, energy efficiency is quite a common theme in Europe for, for many years. What I, uh, if I compare now a little bit, um, the biggest driver of energy efficiency in Europe has been the general public. The general public has a very quickly understood, well, there is money to save, straight into my pocket. I don't have to spend that money if I buy that cheaper light bulb. So, uh, this is a point which I uh, urge to emphasize much more. Uh, that's a challenge for the media because the media is the link to the public. Uh, and this should be done. It's, more, it's not a question, it's more like a recommendation. Excellent. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think so. the questions are on the door from Tommy and uh, I think Baruch are on awareness. Uh, definitely there is a gap in terms of awareness. There is a lot that needs to be done. But I want to Built on what uh, Mr. Walter just said. Uh, they, they, we have always been looking at uh, so many things as government on things. And this is one of the problems we face in this country. Uh, even things that we are actually the drivers, we are the, we are the best people to drive. We, we, we want the government. So at some point, you get the government confused that is it us or is it you? In the case of energy efficiency, clearly what the government is doing is to, to, to create the policy environment. Uh, in terms of awareness, we are still very far off at policy level. What we have done is we were able to set up an interministerial committee within all the ministries, departments, and agencies of government that has anything to do with energy. That's, and that is the group that developed these policies we are talking about. Now, downstream, we have been able to establish sectoral uh, steering committees. Typically, the uh, steering committee on energy and industry, which, we, which is being anchored through the NDSP, uh, is being co chaired by our ministry, the Minister of Power and the Minister of Industry, Trade and Investment. And we have membership from MAN, NASIMA, and so many other players in the industry. And we use that platform to get them to see the policy provisions and to take actions on the ground. Now, beneath the steering committees, we have technical committees on different as aspects. In fact, the technical committees are the ones that did these standards that are particularly the AC standard. So within the policy level, we have a structure. And this structure cut down to the implementation. We're having a similar committee on the housing sector, though it's not as vibrant as the one we have in the industry. We're also having similarly in the clean cooking sector. But it is quite difficult to get to the root of talking to everybody. So it's a challenge for the media, it's a challenge for the public to actually see how they address these issues. Instead of all the terrible stories we are seeing every day of this one is killed, this one is raped. Why don't we start seeing our media talking more about these constructive developmental issues in the, in the, as highlighted, which is what is happening in Europe and, and other parts of the world. So I think the issue is not for government. Of course, government has a lot to do in terms of providing funding, in terms of working with partners, and we are doing quite a lot, but a lot more needs to be done. So, so in terms of energy efficiency, I think uh, it allows this to be done, but I think it's not just the government, but it's rather uh, the entire uh, people. Now, coming to Mr. Patrick's uh, question, which is asking about which agency of government is responsible for energy efficiency. You see, energy efficiency is a multi percentage issue. It's just like renewable energy. So you, you don't usually uh, tie it to just one agency. For instance, the housing sector, when you talk about energy efficiency in the housing sector, you, you are talking more or less in terms of driving the policy, the housing sector. Transport sector is different. But in terms of enforcement, 
we currently have two agencies that have that uh, mandate. Uh, SOM produce or, or develop the standards and ensure compliance with them. Uh, NETSA, which is electricity management services that has been mentioned, has the responsibility to ensure enforcement of all regulations that are within the electricity industry, for instance. So, these agencies will have that responsibility. Of course, like I said, at this stage we are in, not all the standards, not all energy efficiency measures are mandatory. Uh, they are more or less uh, a kind of uh, voluntary, but as we move ahead, definitely there is going to be. If I don't forget, there is, in, in the recent past, a program that was driven by the federal government to ECM where a million uh, LED bulbs were, 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 were I mean, procured to the Korean, I mean, uh, what you call Cuban uh, government, and these this were, were shared. And this are also a lot to do with the provision in, in the budget. Of course, you know the electricity sector itself has a lot of needs, a lot of demands. So many times you don't get to, to have all the money you need to do everything you want to do as a government. But clearly, some efforts have been made, and then the public needs to also do more. I think that's the, 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 the last one. Is, is there a target date for when these uh, concessions? Yeah, yeah. yeah, I think, they were, well, I, there, there clearly is not any specific, because these are dynamic issues. It depends on, on uh, the viewpoint of the, the various sectoral heads. For instance, in the housing, if, if the Minister of Housing uh, finally get the code in place and, and see that there is reason for that, of course these are political issues. If, if we don't set those target dates, yeah. then they become a moving target that can never be realized. But if we, as a country, for instance, if the Ministry of Power, for instance, which interestingly also houses uh, houses, houses <laughs> decides that on this date we are going to have a bonfire of the vanities. I just crack no, I think that is coming. I think definitely that is coming. Having had the I mean, developed the guidelines, having now talked about the code, clearly the minister is, is highly focused on those those issues. But the minister, I mean this is a, a, a political time and they need to be fair. Ah, 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 yes. Okay. So let's let's do it. <laughs> Let's do a takeaway from this. Yeah. And the takeaway being that one of the things you will take back to the ministry is a deep desire from Nigerians to have a target date when we will all convert to energy saving bonds. Can you can that be a takeaway? There is already there is already target set. And, and the essence of those targets is to be, to be realized. But the point that I was, that I was making happen is that uh, in, in, in everything you do, you need to be fair and balanced, right? You don't just put in sanctions uh, without uh, actually being sure that, that these sanctions are even feasible. So, yes, it's just, these are the issues. Yes. Okay. Well, for example, about the courts. Yeah. I think somebody mentioned yeah. it earlier. We could stop importation of any other type of bulbs. Yes, and the only bulbs that we do will be the ones that are energy efficient. Yeah, but we have said that this is exactly what 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 the target has been said that by by twenty thirty hundred percent of all the production should be there. Okay, twenty thirty is too far. is that we want a target date from government as to when the, all, all these things we have in the policy will be implemented. Because if we have that date, it focuses the mind. It focuses all actions towards that date. If they can do it in Ghana, we should be able to do it as giant of Africa. That's what we're saying. Okay, it's noted, uh, I, I think I think the truth is that 
we need to stop these things yesterday, actually, not, not, not in, in, in even tomorrow. But, but, but the point is that uh, these are things that are beneficial to us, and these are things that everybody recognizes as, as useful. So, why do you need somebody to actually come with a cane to say you must do it? This is the point. Why do we have to wait for some minister to come and say, look, Nigeria, everybody must change? Because that is the way life is. We all want to be led. No, you see. We all want to be led. So, and that is why we need leaders. And that is why we need the government to lead. They are the people who The incarnation of Archiva. So let's, I think that's your, your concern. Because I noticed you said, okay, this will be for this one. Yes. But the other ones are cheaper. LEDs are more expensive. But the benefit of LEDs is that if you really want LED for, for five years. Yes. Yes. I hope you I, I know this understood when I say it's political. You see, I, I don't mean it in terms of maybe uh, political as uh, party politics. I mean it in terms of the public. By, yes. Yes. By, by the time by the time you, you come up with, with uh, decisions that that you cannot uh, for any reason uh, justify within a particular time. You you create room for a lot of questions around around uh, the civil society, around uh, uh, even the national assembly, around and it becomes an issue. That's why these are things that people should actually embrace on their own. Okay, so I think we understand ourselves, yes. uh, so we don't overflow this particular issue. The fact is that we're not going to realize these targets until we put a pen in the ground, yeah, and start working towards that. Who should we have? In a yeah, sure. I, was, I was just looking into it to see. Yeah. The, um, I mean, it's you're very right. One of the key barriers to energy efficiency is obviously financing. Financing is a major issue, and the thing is, with financing energy efficiency projects, there are a lot of peculiarities. It is not a typical commercial loan. There are details that need to come with it, which is why we have the concept of the escrows. It is certainly something that NASB has looked at, but not worked on it yet. But there is certainly scope for you know for that to be explored. I'm also aware that beyond the NESP, there are other um, multilateral banks that are coming in. Because the thing is, you, you want an ESCO. For you to have an ESCO, you need to have the funds to actually finance the projects and then recoup your investment from the savings from the energy efficiency projects. So I'm aware that there are other people who are coming in with the funds to support. The, the financial sector. First, you need capacity so that they understand the opportunities available in this market. And then secondly, you need to set aside the funds so you can draw from this fund for this project. Excellent. We'll open it up for questions again um, and comments. But I, I must have seen Tokia Kimi walk into the room. Yes, and I'm going to ask him to talk a little bit about how this electricity service funds is, can work you know, the finance around it, but I'll give you a to think about it while we take questions. Uh, my name is Donald from the Reform Foundation. And um, I like this discussion very well. And when um, Engineer Farouk talked about cost effective tax, I thought he was running my line, but I realized he wasn't, though he had a clue. Now, the thing is, sometimes in looking for solution, we need to be practical. I remember we are in Nigeria. When I came to Abuja, I used to live in Piyakasa. Morning, afternoon, night, all the bombs are all outside. The reason why we could do this is simply because we don't bear the cost directly. Now I moved to Lube, and then I was meet at all of a sudden. I didn't need anybody to tell me to switch up my mind. If I asked everybody here, nobody would move beans with kerosene or gas. You would use your pressure box or something. Now the thing is, you cannot, the major driver of energy efficiency is that direct cost bearing. The consumer needs to bear that cost directly and feel it. Like when a, a person from Ocapula was talking, he said something, he said they observed 40% of their cost was coming from there. If they didn't observe that, or that 40%, they are seeing it, but they are not paying it. It won't be a problem for them. 
I have a cousin that works in NCA. The NCA, they are now switching all their masks from diesel to solar. They are not only running because there's many so much cost, because so many boys are eating from buying diesel. So that is one of them. So what we will be in terms of looking at advocacy and awareness, we've been hearing lots of advocacy, awareness media, but it's not so it. We are Nigerians. We need to feel it first from our pocket directly. If we want to push energy efficiency, meters must be in place. Thank so you. if we get everybody meter, then we'll get energy efficiency. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Obija. I work for Night House. Part of my um, what I wanted to raise has been raised by the gentleman before. First, you need to feel it to perform it. But the second part, I disagree with the moderator that we like to be led. We don't like to be led, we like to be educated. The ministry should. I work for government, so I understand where Farouk is coming from. The ministry cannot, or government cannot do anything. But the primary thing government needs to do which is education. Educate us sufficiently. We can put a timeline on anything, but if I do not know what it is, I will not do it. I can buy the condition bulb for 60 naira, and I buy the electricity bulb for 2,000 naira. And you tell me it will last me five years. Will I leave for five years from now? So I buy the one that serves me now. But if I feel the pinch now, because I am meter, then I decide whether I want to do it now or not. The critical thing is that the ministry should always give in educating Nigerians. Forums like this we talk about the advantages of the LED lamp over this other lamp. Over a period, one year, five years, you can stop everyone from coming. Excellent. I also agree that starting because we are government, you can start in your procurement process in everything that you're doing that carries an energy component. What the specifications should be. And any contractor, consultant who does not meet those specifications does not do anything. Correct. I think that is where we should go, and these are the three points I thought we should look at. Thank you. Good evening, uh, my name is Roman I'm the CEO of Blue Camera Energy. Uh, my first observation or contribution will go to Mr. Farouk. Uh, I really do think that the private sector and private entrepreneurs. Uh, actually, the movers of the renewable energy sector because they are doing more than even the government right now. Uh, but I think that there is too much emphasis on government executing projects rather than being policy makers. I'll give an example. We may not go very deep into that, but I still remember very clearly the 9 billion that have been put into the Clean Stones project. We still don't know where that money is today. But I can imagine 9 billion have been spent or used to support them to in Nigeria and how much we can, or how much we'll be doing on Kingston right now. Um, secondly, I also think that too much emphasis is still being put, that's a to now. I think too much emphasis is being put at certain certifications that are not relevant at this time. Uh, we've left that to, with all due respect to uh, Korean, but I don't think Korean should be a relevant uh, pre-qualification for renewable energy entrepreneurs to be registered by, you know. I have Korean engineers who come to understand what we're doing and learn from it. So why do you have to subject me to Korean before I can be certified and be allowed to execute certain government projects? So I think it's important to take note of that. Uh, totally, I think government has a lot or government agencies are not sufficiently engaging the entrepreneurs that are moving this industry. I'll give a clear example. There has been no official visit from any government agency to the only and the first concrete apartment where we have energy efficiency at its best. There has been no official visit to see how this thing is working. I know quite a number of them have been sneaking in to see how they can put it in their homes. But officially, we have not been visited by any government agency. We have been running for two years of the grid in Abuja here. Thank God for um, the um, so many you know, um, NGOs that have been promoting what we're doing, but we have not seen any government you know, involvement. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. My name is Sergio uh, Shiri from Standard Um, I think most of what I wanted to say have already been said by Baruch and Doris. But I just want to emphasize uh, on one of the things. First, 
the, the issue of uh, uh, awareness. Um, people are talking about enforcement. Enforcement has limitation. I think if we do a collaborative approach to things, I think we'll get better results. If you take enforcement, for example, if I see the level on the ACs and whatever, and the capacities and everything, but I don't, I'm not aware of what my house requires, what my room requires, it is still a problem. So the awareness should be wholesome. Because if you, you can still have all those things and it's correct, but when you go to buy the wrong thing, looking at the capacity, you still have problems. So that awareness, we need to really emphasize it. And then the collaboratory approach. By the time we take each of each stakeholder and then engage those stakeholders, we have more results than if we just do a blanket awareness of Excellent. these things. And then on standards, I think um, we've already gotten the standards approved and so on. The standards, some will eventually become uh, mandatory, like Farouk actually said, especially the plural standards. But for the system standard, is actually voluntary. But at least there are um, a lot of incentives that you can gain, and especially for the SMEs. SMA has already said giving a, a blanket 50% reduction on any cost to SMEs, on especially all the management systems and certifications. So if you tap on those benefits, I think they, they should be able to benefit from it. And we've developed enough capacity for trainings in these areas. Uh, Lawrence has already said it. With partnership with them, we develop capacity for training and assessment, auditing. And then we went ahead to uh, engage BSI to do a train the trainer course for us. So we have a lot of trainers and we are only waiting for the uh, people that will come and, and take those trainings for us. That's my own contribution. Excellent. Thank you. My name is Sean Ellenden from Move to Technology. See, uh, listening to the program, I've noticed that one particular thing that keeps coming up is the cost of energy efficient uh, appliances. And nobody seems to be talking about how to reduce the cost of those appliances. Perhaps we're thinking, okay, they are, they are not produced here, so maybe we can control the cost. But when you look at what other countries are doing, you find out that for companies that produce energy efficient appliances, there are some kind of waivers and rebates that are granted them so they can produce it at a lower cost. If Nigeria becomes such a country where an environment like that is provided for people who produce energy efficiency, I mean energy efficient appliances, then we can begin to drive down that cost. Excellent. Both for energy efficient and the generation and uh, what do you call it? Sure. Um, I'll... Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I just wanted to uh, to support uh, for the point because I don't discover the passion that I have in trying to put a deadline for the scrapping of 8% board. I think I will the commission with the challenges which cannot make anybody here put a different date. So the challenge is like what? Yeah, I'll mention that. Okay. Um, someone just mentioned here the parts in Europe, where the main driver is the cost. You look at what value is going to happen to your pocket, then you take it short. Once you are, you are well educated, you have knowledge, you are aware of it. So awareness and probably can be the also okay. Someone might also talk about when there are meters, the benefits. Because when you see the cost, that's for those who will have the meters and they will not spoil it or by passing the control to do any energy efficiency measure in their program. That is one. Then two, we look at the rural communities where you have very poor people who barely struggle to feed. It becomes more expensive for them to have very expensive lighting systems like CFLs and LEDs that probably with a little bit power supply was not stay the five years, the ten years exactly in them. Because the power comes from and goes rapidly sometimes, the voltage is very low, and there are also factors that affect the life of these examples. Then too, you have uh, the CFF, the big example that have been produced currently. I think we have some proofs for the If I go to ban such programs, 
I also went to choose a productive job. This also something that meant to not just come up with needed to do it. You know that it has some defect on the economy and even on the people. That's just on that point and the person really like it. Then somebody took about the same thing. If problem was goals, an aspect I think government needs to should consider is to probably come up with some incentives that will encourage people like the poor ones who will probably need to have this measure because it's good and probably will help the environment and probably will increase power somehow because we are going to probably consume less for that people to benefit. Then we also be looking at the options from the government side to put some incentives so that probably if you are going to buy these bulbs, people care about the cheaper rate. It's going to be important, so the transition is given to make it cheap and affordable for all. But if you cannot, if you put a ban, you're going to be speed up people for it. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is E. G. Shaibu from the law firm of Okonadeva Dan and Co. I'll be speaking from the legal point of view. Uh, it is common knowledge that one of the contributing factors of the development crisis in Nigeria is lack of continuity in development uh, policies and energy. When discussing anything energy, also discussing energy, it could be from the economy aspect. Now my question goes to us that is the ministry considering what role the law has to play in this discussion so far? Because uh, Mr. Farouk, he has this passion, but he may leave tomorrow. Someone else will come with a different policy. Now, what, 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 what law are we going to put in place that will shake uh, this uh, sustainability in every policy. So really the legal framework, right? Yes, sir. Excellent. Yes, sir. And in terms of, uh, in talk of sanction, we still need sanction. Let there be sanction first. Excellent. Before uh, Nigeria starts crying out. But I believe if there are sanction, definitely people will, will try to comply. Excellent. Easily. Excellent. Thank you. Being a major challenge with adopting energy efficiency. We also talked about setting up uh, electricity service, uh, electricity management companies to help in pushing energy efficiency. I was thinking if you could share with us um, some thoughts on how we can get around um, these challenges, just purely from a financial point of view. Thank you. Thank you. Um, for energy efficient um, devices, there's usually a larger upfront cost. But over the life of using the appliances, you would um, earn your, your return on your return investment. Um, Nigeria, the problem in Nigeria is first of all the inflation. Inflation is double digit, uh, close to 20%. That makes financing very difficult. And um, interest rates are at um, 30% now, 28 to 30%. Makes it even more difficult. Um, what we are advocating right now is that. Um, the same with the international funds for a lot of these um, sectors. There should be some kind of fund that we can borrow from to fund um, household appliances, energy efficient appliances. Um, just the same way that you can borrow, you can normally lease a generator, but this time you lease it and then there's a special mobility fund that you can access. Um, for ESCOs, you talked about ESCOs, the Energy Service Conference. I'm going to ask one of my friends here to talk about ESCOs, actually, as an expert in ESCOs. <laughs> Then it's to you, the man. I know. Um, I'm not an expert on ESCOs. I know, I know more than him probably on this. So basically, um, uh, hi. Uh, I'm, I'm working with Demitopia on building energy efficient homes in Nigeria. So that's basically how we're cooperating. Uh, but I happen to know a bit about the uh, about energy service companies, uh, ESCOs, since we, uh, our family, we operate one what we call TESCO, uh, Telecom Energy Services Company, actually the biggest in Nigeria and one of the biggest in Africa. Um, basically, an ESCO is a company which is a commercial uh, entity, for-profit or not-for-profit, that uh, raises, let's say, raises enough capital to sell electricity to people later on, uh, through coordination uh, with the public sector, uh, such as, I'm not sure what's the name of the body in Nigeria, but I know that the Ministry of Powers and Housing 
towards uh, what we call PPAs, power purchase agreements, to companies uh, to establish power plants and sell it to people. Uh, so, what I know, correct me if I'm wrong, that the, there is a lack, uh, there is a queue actually of companies wanting to invest in PPAs and power purchase agreements uh, uh, in Nigeria and want to sell it to people. However, there there is, if I'm not mistaken, a uh, uh, a, a deficit in the ministry or something that there is a queue of companies but they're not getting uh, they are not being able to start operations uh, because the uh, government still owes money to the, uh, the metal power producers and the company and the country uh, nevertheless one smart solution would be private uh, sector private sector doing small scale power plants or small scale power purchase uh, power purchase agreements what we call take or pay agreements uh, this is a very good, very, very good solution. However, the challenge comes with having to sell electricity to these private institutions. You need these private institutions to um, believe in that and to commit to buying electricity for a long period of time. Otherwise, it's very hard for people like the Metope to raise capital uh, for, for these investments, no matter how small they is, uh, there, there are. Um, so basically, the, the, the challenge lies in, co in getting commitments from people, bank commitments, bankable commitments, that they will purchase the electricity for a, a defined number of years in order to be able to raise capital. That's, that's the main challenge, but that's the biggest opportunity in my opinion. Excellent. Thank you so much. Can you respond to that question of cost? Because to me, that is something I'm very passionate about, the cost element. I think one of the key things that we don't seem to understand all of us, a lot of us is the fact that when you talk about the cost of an energy efficient equipment, the cost is not limited to the cost of implementation. It's actually a live central costing approach. So you have to do cost comparison based on how much does it cost to put the inefficient equipment in place and how much does it cost to run that inefficient equipment for the useful lifetime of the equipment, including operational and maintenance. These are based on how much does it cost to put in place an energy efficient equipment and then run it. And um, maybe IODG has one or two examples, but the key ones you find, the very basic examples you find are lighting. It costs as much to put in place, say, if you go to a factory that has those lights that they use as street lights. It costs as much to put them, but it costs so much to run them. Plus, they have this limited lifetime. Whereas, you put in place an LED which is more expensive, but you get 10,000 hours of lifetime. And they consume much less. And I give you a very basic example. I recently changed all the lights in the bedroom. And my cousin said, why do you have four lights in the bedroom? But I had one light in my bedroom that was 30 watts. And I have four lights now that are 6 watts each. So that's 24, 24 watts. That's definitely less than 30 watts. More in number, but less in the energy it draws. And therefore, in the long run, when you do the life cycle costing, how long, how long does it take to run? That's what we should be looking at when we talk about energy efficiency. And because that's exactly where the air is supposed to come from. Yeah, um, just to respond to Kramel, Blue Kramel, I, I think. You see. Okay. Yes, yes. Uh, just to apologize that the public sector or the ministry has not been able to visit your property project. Uh, we apologize for that. Obviously, it's an awareness issue as well. So the awareness is a two-way thing. We, we need to also get uh, more details about what you are doing so that we'll be able to, to connect with you. But I assure you that within the couple of days, we should be uh, there. Uh, there has been a lot of talk about uh, cost of energy efficiency appliances. Uh, I think this is a major issue that could also help in improving energy efficiency performance around the sector. But I'd like to announce that the uh, fiscal policy paper of 2012 actually exempts all energy equipment from payment of duty and which I think should be able to help uh, energy efficiency uh, equipment. Uh, within the ministry, we've been working with a lot of uh, developers to, to, to clear goods, particularly renewable energy project goods, 
to the process of going to this uh, finance the revenue office and, and so far I think we, we have uh, not had any challenges. The challenge is when you come with, with, with an idea, not a project, then there's no who can help you because we need the bill of lending, we need all the shipping documents for us to be able to, to, to support you with your ideas. So yes, it's an issue, but I think uh, there is a way around it. If you have genuine uh, imports of energy equipment, uh, you can contact us and we should be able to, to help. Uh, I think generally the con consensus has so far been uh, that uh, awareness creation, cost reflective tariffs, uh, support for the initial cost, and uh, in fact specifications for, for public procurement will help in improving energy efficiency. So, so we take note of that and we will do our best to make sure that the leadership of our ministry is also aware. Thank you. Engineer Dada, I know there was no direct question to you, but I, was, I wonder if in the course of the conversation there are some thoughts uh, you have to share. Yes, I actually have a lot of things to share. But let me start with this. I was in a program in the US and one of the things that made America as a country embraced energy efficiency is it was they had a crisis. I think in 1977 or there about in the 70s. So they had this great energy crisis, and it made the country as a whole to strategize towards embracing energy efficiency. The second thing is commercial buildings in the U.S. Almost half of it is owned by the American government. And so they have to come up with a building code, a lot of things, uh, the energy star, energy efficiency codes, and those kind of systems. So what am I saying to the government? Some of, the, uh, of our friends there have already mentioned it. Let's start from home. Let's start from our Nigeria as a country, the federal government, the state government. What buildings are we putting up? What energy efficiency measures are we adopting? When we do this, we would obviously be reducing the impact of our energy, the, the, the energy we consume. And we can also tell the story, because like Lawrence said, a lot of case studies we have in the sector, it's not Nigerian case studies, they are foreign case studies. But we need to start um, saying our own stories. And I believe with that, we will be able to Excellent. Um, yeah. I think it's a good time to. Okay, you have a question here. Yeah, you've been trying to get your question through. Yeah. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Give it to me. Give that you put in my hand. I know. I apologize. <laughs> I have uh, questions in all the parties. The first one is to the um, I want to first of all look at what uh, my colleague who said he went to the for the program study. My name is Engineer Promise. I work with Green Environment and Energy Conservation Commission. Um, I'm very aware that. Energy Commission of Nigeria has done a lot of work on this particular topic in the discussion. But through all the discussions, I've not had anything said about what they have done, except when you mentioned about the replacement of the CFLs But on this particular energy efficiency industry, because we have digressed a lot in asking both in household transport, we refuse to concentrate more on the topic of the day. I'm sure they have done a lot of things, maybe in the energy industry, so many other things. And this uh, Nigerian energy support program should also carry them along so that there won't be lapses in making people to know what is actually happening. Like you asked, who is actually going to enforce or implement this policy? Minister of Power, yes, is specifically for electricity. The Energy Commission, we know, we collaborate with them. 
they are the energy policy making organ of federal government of Nigeria. I'm sure they must have made policies sure. relating to this particular thing we are talking about. Excellent. And what exactly is that policy you talked about? There are two policies. One that Farouk talked about, and the one that um, Lawrence talked about. What is the relationship between these two policies and what has been existing before in energy commission? Because I know they have national energy policy, they have renewable energy policy produced by energy commission of Nigeria before this policy. Yes. Are they the same? That is one for Farouk. The second one question is going to Mr. Lawrence. Um, Mr. Lawrence, you said um, there are no specific targets in the National Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Policy. And you gave the reason for the reason for that was there were no data. I disagree with you. That shouldn't be. If you come out to set out your policy, you can as well put certain targets. Yes, you don't have to have the whole data on earth regarding that particular issue before you set your target. You can set targets, measurable targets. That it has okay after a while, let's see what people have done. Have they been able to meet yes, the targets or not? So that is what I'm saying. You have to please work on it. They will respond because there's certain assumptions in your office. The last the last is for the ah. NPC. Um, you said uh, you were able to achieve sixteen percent energy efficiency in your factory for your industry you reduced you had uh, like sixty percent. My question is, could you please share with this house the amount of money spent in achieving this so that other industry operators here can actually know the amount of money you spent to achieve this? Because everybody knows if you change this, if you change your, maybe you are, you are, you are, you are compressor, change your pump, do this, you achieve this. Then they may not have the money. Okay. Then that money, and they tell us, what are you, when are you expecting to Get the return on investment on that, but these things we do. Thanks. If we can take just one minute each because we've really gone to the end. Yeah. Okay. I just want to say that uh, the School Energy Commission has, has done a lot of work and we're working together in almost all the policies that we mentioned. Uh, energy Commission has been an integral part of it. So uh, there is really no no difference between the policies done by the Energy Commission and the policies done by the Minister of Power. Uh, the Interministerial Committee that I mentioned, the uh, Energy Commission is an integral part of the it's a founding member of that committee. So all the policies done in the Minister of Power, there is clear input uh, and validation within the Energy Commission. Uh, just for your records and information, currently in the energy sector, there's about four policies that have been approved. The first is electric power sector policy of 2001. The second is national energy policy of 2003. The third is rural education policy of 2009, policy paper. And the fourth is national renewable energy and energy efficiency policy of 2015. Of course, there are action plans and uh, which culminate into the uh, action agenda of the country, which is approved in 2000, uh, so July 2016. So these are the policies that are currently approved. In terms of law, uh, we currently have, I mean, overarching law is the Electric Power Sector Reform Act of 2005 and the NEMSA uh, Act uh, of, of, I think, 2000. Over there, but no, I uh, think 14. Excellent. So, so, so these are the, the, the laws outside of which, of course, there are a number of regulations that are, are pursuant to some of these laws. So, any other law that is in a draft form uh, may not necessarily be referenced when you are talking uh, in terms of what government is actually uh, committed to. And I think that is the issue you, you are having when probably you refer to. Uh, the renewable energy policy done outside of this policy by uh, renewable I mean, uh, energy commission, the National Energy Commission. 
and uh, those laws have actually been uh, drafted. They are excellent document, but they were what formed the current document that we did together with the Energy Commission, which was approved by the Federal Executive Council, like I mentioned, in 2018. So I think uh, this is the summary of, of the policy status in the country as of today. Thank you very much. Uh, Lawrence, you can take a minute and also make your closing remarks. Okay. Um, and I promise, I think the first thing I want to say is I was actually referring to the same policy that Sarah was talking about, which is the National Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Policy of 2015. I think April 2015 to be precise. As much as I know, mostly in Nigeria, uh, that is the only policy as far as energy efficiency is concerned that is approved. I'm not saying there are no draft policies. Of course there are. But that is the only policy that is approved, which is why we have to make reference to it. Um, on the issue of the National Energy Efficiency Action Plan, specifically, that's the action plan that I make reference to, which is a product of the policy, because the policy mandates that there should be an energy efficiency action plan, there should also be a renewable energy action plan. On the energy efficiency action plan, there are no targets when you go to the section of that document that talks about the targets for energy efficiency achievements in the industrial sector. And quite frankly, from the recommendations I, I talked about earlier during my remark, there is no way you can have targets when you do not have data to back it up. You cannot manage what you don't measure. So essentially, you must have what you call a baseline. If you don't have a baseline, it means you cannot you can't, you can't even have objective to work sure. towards. Sure. So, I mean, I stand to be corrected, however, as much as I know, I am very certain that if we have data for the sector, then we could actually put in place uh, more targeted. Thank, Thank you so much. And uh, Okay, Angela, I promise. <laughs> I can give you 50 scenarios. But first, um, Nigerian Morning Company is no more a PLC, it's now limited. So there is actually <laughs> the kind of information I can put out. Um, they make uh, Alexis and Lawrence uh, witnesses to the stress. <laughs> Even the speech, everything I was going to make here, I had to go through a lot of approvals and my presence here. But let me tell you one, I'll just hold you. I have a plant that uses things from a normal steam boiler. It cost me over 120 million per annum to fire that steam as it will fuel the boiler and to produce steam from the boiler. Now, I buy another type of boiler, a boiler that can use waste heat from a gas generator. The payback is one year. Wow, that's all. So at times it's just information. We don't have the information or we don't have the will, the leadership. And that's why when you ask me about SMEs, if the leaders know, if they make inquiries, I mean, my boss and myself, we became stars in NBC. We didn't use our money. We used the company's money. But what did we do? We brought the information to the table. And we said, this is what we think we should do. We had a strategy. And then the strategy, like I mentioned within that five minutes, there was strategy for plants that had gas. And there was strategy for plants that had to depend on the grid. If I want to run generators with diesel 100 percent it costs me about 80 naira or 88 naira an hour. If I want to run from the grid, it's about 40 something naira. Yes. Do the math, it's simple. But I have to invest in UPS because of the quality of the grid. That's the investment we have to do. Thank you. Uh, please join me in a round of applause for the panel. And yes, we have to go through a lot of hoops to get in here, but we thought it was important to have this case study. Um, just again to thank you for always honoring us with your presence uh, every month as we organize these events. Uh, we know you could have been anywhere else, but you chose to come. We think it's important enough, and that's why we do it every month. And uh, you think it's important enough, and that's why you come to join us. We want to especially thank the Nigeria Legislative uh, Support Program uh, for the partnership and collaboration we have with them 
in trying to mainstream discussions around energy efficiency. The last time we had this discussion, uh, the lady who was on the panel stated clearly that energy efficiency is almost like having a building a new power plant. You know, and we think it's that important, and we intend to continue to uh, push this agenda. Um, same time, next month, third Wednesday, we'll be here. We think the topic is going to be around waste power. We think. Uh, we're still trying to line up the right people to be on the panel. If we're able to do that, we think it's an area that most people kind of understand theoretically, but do not quite understand how it works. So we're trying to see if we can uh, put that together. Um, we recently, a little bit of advertisement, we recently started a weekly column with these day newspapers and what we tend to do with that product at Power Nigeria is to educate the public on the power sector in the book that a more educated Nigerian public can then make more informed demands from Engineer Farouk and the government. Um, we thank Engineer Farouk uh, very specially for uh, agreeing to be at the panel. Um, it is not easy to carry the cross for the Nigerian government. <laughs> it is not easy. Uh, so sometimes when we push their representatives, we also realize that they are Nigerians like ourselves who are trying to do the best they can within a system that is broken in many parts. So if you have a we thank you so much for being here. And just to say finally that I believe we still have some drinks and food left. It would be a shame if you just get up and leave without talking to at least 10 people. Because one of the reasons why we do this is to create an opportunity for people to network. So if you live here with less than 10 fitness cards, you've done yourself a great service. Thank you so much and we look forward to seeing you again next week.